Canada's Borders that is joining us. My name is Tamil Kendall, and I'm the director of the Partnership for Women's Health Research Canada, also known as POWER. And before we get started with the scientific part of the program, I want to acknowledge that I'm joining from the unceded traditional territory of the Lekwungen peoples and the Esquimalt, Songhees, and Sanic First Nations in what is colonially known as Victoria, BC, and to really sincerely express my gratitude for being here as an uninvited guest on these lands. And since we are joining from coast to coast to coast and beyond, I would invite you to take a moment to think about the traditional territories and the peoples um, where you're joining from today. So a little about POWER or the partnership, we're an alliance between four women's health research institutes, the Women's Health Research Institute in British Columbia, the Women's and Children's Health Research Institute in Alberta, the Women's College Research Institute at Women's College Hospital in Ontario, and IWK Health, which is located in Halifax, but has uh, mandate to serve the Maritimes in maternal infant women's uh, children's and family health. Uh, the vision of our alliance is better health for all women, trans, and non-binary people through research equity, excellence, and inclusion. And we're supported in moving that vision forward by the BC Women's Health Foundation Foundation, the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, the Women's College Hospital Foundation, and the IWK Foundation, as well as, of course, all of the researchers that belong to the research institutes. And part of achieving this vision is really to have a national conversation about women's health and women's health research and how we can promote the use of the excellent research that's done in Canada to influence practice um, as well as policy. So you all are a very important part of this conversation that we're having. And I would invite you today to please um, share your thoughts as we go along and, and your questions in the chat. And I will pick those up um, either immediately following each of the speakers, if it's a kind of burning clarification question or in the moderated discussion that we'll have at the end. The theme of our 2023-2024 uh, women's Health Research Seminar Series is Improving Women's Healthcare Through Research. And today we're going to hear from an impressive cross-country panel of researchers who are advancing precision women's health and personalized medicine. So without further ado, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Cheng Han Lee, a member of WICRI. Dr. Lee is an associate professor at the Department of Laboratory Medicine and Pathology and is the current Sawin Baldwin Chair in Ovarian Cancer Research at the University of Alberta. Dr. Lee received his MD PhD degree and anatomic pathology residency training at the University of British Columbia. The current focus of his laboratory is on the genetics and biology of aggressive gynecologic cancer, and he has applied various next-generation sequencing methods and high-throughput assays to gain insights into these tumors, including the most aggressive subtypes of uterine cancer. Dr. Lee currently has over 160 peer review publications and a number of book chapters, including chapters in the latest World Health Organization classification of female genitor tumors. Clinically, he is also a consultant pathologist at the Royal Alexandra Hospital in Edmonton with a focus on diagnostic, the diagnosis of gynecologic oncology and pathology. Please, Dr. Lee, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamil. Um, and uh, it's a privilege and pleasure to be invited today to talk to uh, 
a group of like-minded researchers uh, who are focused on improving women's health. Uh, and, and today I'm going to actually talk, focus a bit more on this unusual type of uh, Mullerian cancer or gynecologic tract cancer called the differentiated cancer. And, and I want to illustrate an example of how we were able to sort of use a carefully selected uh, preclinical model to actually identify uh, potential candidate drugs that, uh, that, that you wouldn't have necessarily predicted uh, would be the candidates uh, um, going through. And uh, here are my disclosure statements. So in terms of cancers, uh, we're talking about epithelial malignancy. As you know, you know, cancer, they tend to recapitulate the original differentiation that's uh, exhibited by the originating epithelium. You know, here you have breast cancer that with the terminal lobular ductal units and then invasive ductal carcinoma, which is the most common type of breast cancer, recapitulate that ductal formation structure. In prostate cancer, you have these acinar units and the, the, the prostate cancer in general, the better differentiated one also recapitulate our acinar structures. And more importantly, when you look at how closely this tumor or these cancer resemble the originating epithelium and devise a differentiation grade uh, or histologic based differentiation grade based on that, they prove to be uh, highly prognostic in both setting of prostate and ovarian cancer uh, and breast cancer. And that certainly is the case across actually different anatomic sites, such as in the ovary and in the mitrum as well. And, uh, and part of this probably has to do with concept that, you know, as tumor become more fully differentiated, uh, uh, they, they revert back to more of the stem cell state. And in the most extreme scenario, a cancer cell can, can become completely undifferentiated such that as the pathologist, there will be no way for me to tell you it's actually a carcinoma uh, beyond the experience. Um, so, you know, without further ado, going to this, the differential antigenic cancer, uh, the gynecologic tract, and the two most common locations are that uh, the endometrium and the ovaries. And uh, it, I just want to sort out the terminology. So when we refer to the differentiated carcinoma in the sites, what we mean is that this cancer has actually two components, a well-differentiated component that's a, consists of very well-differentiated gland-forming carcinomas, and then and then a completely undifferentiated carcinoma component. And in the instances where we cannot identify the precursor better differentiated carcinoma component, we refer to these uh, undifferentiated cancers. And this is an example of the differentiation gynecologic tract cancer, where you have on this uh, lower corner, uh, well differentiated gland forming, adenocarcinoma, endometrioid type, and then it abruptly uh, transform into this very undifferentiated tumor that uh, histologically really doesn't form any structure that's recognizable as a, a cancer or carcinoma. And, uh, and if you look at keratin stainings, uh, basically the only the better differentiated component shows keratin staining. If you stain with E-cadherin, it will be the same appearance. Um, whereas the undifferentiated component just, they, they look very primitive. And by gene expression profile analysis, one would see that uh, um, genes such as SOX2, uh, SOX uh, 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 TBX1, that are usually associated with stemness shows is more is very significantly upregulated in the differentiated component, whereas any epithelial differentiation or cell adhesion molecule is significantly downregulated down in the differentiated component. And and through some of the work that that us uh, our group and others have done uh, over the last sort of uh, um, you know almost ten years now, uh, that we are able to identify the key genomic drivers uh, that at least is a very important genomic trigger for the differentiation in endometrial and ovarian cancer. And these are core member of the uh, of the Swinson complex proteins uh, where a, a well-differentiated endometrial cancers uh, can sustain both loss or genomic inactivation, IA1A1B, and, and that will result in undifferentiated tumor. I put the additional steps here because we do know now that there are additional steps required for that differentiation to occur. Uh, similarly, you can have smart A4 inactivation or smart B1 inactivation that will also result in the same undifferentiated phenotype. And this is an example I showed earlier, but the differentiated endometrial cancer, and this is this tumor shows inactivation of uh, smart A4. Another example here where you have the differentiated cancer, well, the better differentiated component is on the left here, and the undifferentiated component is on the right. Everyone is generally already lost in the undifferentiated components. 
uh, sorry, generally also already in the well differentiated component. So you have lots of protein seen in both component. However, in the differentiation, everyone B is additionally inactivated genomically. And therefore, the expression is intact in the well differentiated component, but that additional steps where that's uh, associated with the differentiation where you see everyone B is inactivated as well. Clinically, I just want to draw your attention that majority of these women with uh, the differentiated cancer, they present with advanced stage disease. In terms of endometrial cancer, stage three, four is when the tumor has gone outside of the uterus. So not surgically uh, removable. And uh, what's more sort of uh, concerning is that this tumor is clinically highly aggressive. So as I say, majority of women present with stage three, four in disease, and the medium disease-free survival, uh, disease-specific survival is about four and a half months by Kaplan-Meier analysis, and uh, and that's despite the use of any, you know, if the woman was well enough to receive uh, adjuvant uh, or or new adjuvant uh, chemotherapy, that's despite the use of chemotherapy, chemo radiation therapy, and this is this is a very truly rapidly progressive course that that you know, makes uh, the dementia of cancer basically the most aggressive gynecologic cancer. And uh, and the other unusual finding here is that these dementia of cancer, when you revert back to the stem cell like undifferentiated state, it seems to have a VIP path throughout the body. They spread in a manner that's basically, that's basically only parallel by small cell card lung cancer, where they, they, they spread not just to lung, but also adrenal gland, brain, liver, soft tissue, bone, kidneys. They, they spread to places that you wouldn't imagine endometrial cancer or ovarian cancer to spread to. And I also want to mention that, you know, the same tumor is seen actually in the ovary as well, and, uh, and, and, and they are historically very much identical to uh, the dementia endometrial cancer, and these are the, these aggressive undifferentiated cancer that one sees. And behaviorally, um, so in terms of ovarian cancer staging, uh, stage one is when the tumor is largely confined to the ovary. Stage two, four is when it's actually gone out of the ovary. And if you look at this, um, for, for advanced stage disease of this ovarian tumor type, uh, they behave also as equally aggressive as the, the dimension of mitral cancer with a very rapidly progressive clinical course, uh, medium survival, again, under six months. So, I mean, you know, we've gotten a lot better at recognizing sort of what the underlying genomic driver is for some of these aggressive gynecologic cancers. But however, you know, there's continue, there's a continued lack of sort of knowledge in terms of therapeutic uh, insights. And uh, this is partially for something like the dementia and endometrial marine cancer is partially due to the fact that these cancers in general are less common. It, well, it accounts about one to 2% of endometrial cancer and about less than, I would say, less than 1% of ovarian cancer. So there's a limited number of patients for clinical trial or for you to gain in any sort of proficiency in managing these patients clinically. And there's also, in addition, because it is rapidly aggressive clinical course, there's also limited clinical therapeutic window for any oncologists to attempt the additional line of treatments. And, uh, and, and re really, this bottleneck has to be addressed or circumvented with, with, with more accurate uh, preclinical model development where we can evaluate in a preclinical setting uh, additional drug candidates. And, and this is really sort of the underlying opinion of this talk is that, you know, for some of these molecularly or clinically, molecularly unique, clinically aggressive cancer type that may not be well represented there out in, out there in terms of the cell line model that's commercially available, we need actually to drive precision oncology for these women, we actually need precision models. And these are just, I'm just listing some example of these precision models. Uh, the ones in blue is what we have tended for the dementia of cancer. And today I'm gonna focus more on the ones in red where we have primary sort of uh, patient tumor derived cell line models, uh, three dimensional uh, spheroid models, as well as the uh, 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 PDX and CDX models. So, this is in collaboration with Mark Curry in Vancouver, uh, who is a longtime collaborator and a close friend of mine, uh, that uh, um, we were able to establish uh, to date uh, four patient tumor derived model of this dementia the cancer. These are the dementia endometrial cancer. And uh, these tumor models, uh, uh, when you grow them, actually pasture them in uh, PDX models, they recapitulate the, the, the histology as well as the 
the, the immunochemistry staining pattern of the parental tumors. And, uh, and moreover, when you look at the molecular features such as mutation profile, methylation profile, these tumor also clearly resemble that of the parental tumor. What's very interesting is that when you look at the, uh, a, 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 a clustering analysis based on global methylation profile, uh, I don't know if you could see that they are triangle dots here and red uh, and circle dots here. And these color match ones are three sets of uh, 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 PDX models where the the PDX tumor, even after three, four passages, their methylation profile is basically clustered right next or over top of, uh, of the parental tumor, indicating the methylation profile is very much well conserved here. And then uh, um, when you, uh, when, um, well, when we actually, and, and this methylation profile, that's very much uh, um, uh, sort of uh, said actually in these models, uh, it turns out that when the, and these are the, this is the additional step I was referring to. Um, in addition to the coarse Winston complex uh, inactivation, you also need methylation shifts uh, clinically where, um, you know, the on this major cluster, these are mostly undifferentiated cancer and this cluster is mostly differentiated cancer and many of these are match pairs from the same patient tumor sample as it did differentiate. And you can see a clear shift in methylation, global methylation profiles in these uh, two group of cancers. And and actually what's very interesting is that we CRISPR engineer um, uh, by knocking out smart gate for uh, models of the, this differentiated cancer. We also observe sort of similar directional or directionality of methylation changes uh, in this CRISPR engineer model as it become more undifferentiated. Uh, this is a CRISPR engineer model that uh, 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 Mackenzie Colton, who's the PhD student and I co-supervised with Impossivit, uh, uh, generated. And what happens here is that uh, when we knock out SMARC A4, in the initial generations, uh, the tumor is still very well differentiated. But in subsequent passaging in mice, uh, the tumor start to become undifferentiated. And this is paralleled by um, changes in global methylation profile pattern you see here. So, so methylation changes is also another key component, key step actually in this process of the differentiation. And you now what, you know, from, from this study, you know, we're able to gain insight into what genes or what 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 pathways that are apparently affected by these global methylation changes. And, and what's very interesting beyond sort of uh, post-transcriptome gene sentencing and cell adhesion uh, pathway is that lymphocyte media immunity antigen presentation is so significantly altered as the tumor becomes more differentiated. Uh, in terms of the models, um, we also were able to, in addition to the, the xenograft tumor models, we're able to derive in vitro uh, models of these tumors where the tumor are capable of growing in 3D spheroid, where when you, if you take a section of, the, of how these cells grow in 3D spheroid, they look very much similar to what you see in a hysterectomy or in the parental tumor samples, indicating that the way at least it's growing is recapitulate what happens in vivo, and this make it highly ideal for in vitro assays. And with that in mind, we decided to uh, collaborate with Dr. Franco Vizier Kumar's lab at Saskatchewan Cancer Agency, where he has uh, about uh, a, a, a high throughput sort of uh, AD approved uh, drug compound libraries with the robotic systems. And then we subjected our tumor to, uh, to these uh, drug repurposing screens. So these are about 1,800 FDA approved uh, drug compound libraries that encompass a range of cancer or non-cancer uh, drugs. Uh, that uh, because we, you know, if you think about this, well, these tumors are so aggressive and we have such limited knowledge of what additional line of therapy may or may not work in this tumor that uh, um, now we have an ideal biologically represented model. It will be, it, it is a logical first step to try a drug repurpose in screen. And now to, to our surprise, the drug repurposing screen, uh, four of the top five hits are actually cardiac glycosides. So these are uh, family uh, plasma membrane sodium potassium ADPS inhibitors uh, that is most commonly used for the treatment of congestive heart failure. And this, this encompasses four of the top five hits. Digoxin and digitoxin are the more commonly used drug, especially digoxin in, uh, in the setting of CHF. And uh, to further validate this finding, we did the uh, dose response curve, again, in vitro 3D spheroid assays. 
And what we see here is that the, the differential of cancer, which inactivates, has inactivated the Swinson complex, they show a much lower IC50 compared to uh, non-DDEC endometrial cancer. The IC50 is generally about 10 folds lower for the differential of endometrial cancer, which means that the differential of endometrial cancer are, are more sensitive, more susceptible to the effect of digoxin and digitoxin. And you know, we're in the midst of a, a, a more definitive in vivo study, but uh, last month we performed a, a pilot study just to make sure the logistic work out and the animal tolerated dose we are given. Um, and that, uh, uh, and this is only based on three mice per group. And what, what's very encouraging that in the digitoxin group, uh, uh, which we actually gave a, a more optimal uh, dosing schedule, at uh, least actually already with three mice, there were already significant difference in the uh, size of these tumor growth. Uh, with digoxin, it was, it was not statistically significant, but also we, we ran into a little bit of logistical issue with that batch of corn oil starch, which was used as vehicles. So our dosing was not, uh, was not to the schedule. So, so now we've, um, we are performing more definitive study, but these initial results support the inhibitor activity of digoxin, digitoxin in vivo. And, you know, I mean, story like this do makes nice headlines, but what's beyond this is that, um, you know, the, these family of drugs have been known for some time to have some anti-cancer activity, and there are some pathway, additional pathway beyond the sodium potassium ATBS inhibition that has been uh, identified. And I think what's very key here is we need to figure out actually why do the differential cancer, why are they more sensitive to these inhibitions, and what are the specific pathway involved so we can look to more specifically target those pathways and, and, and essentially be able to more optimally uh, um, inhibit these pathways that are involved. So what I've described here is, is kind of like a roadmap for how we might be able to approach these um, less common but molecularly unique and clinically um, aggressive type of uh, gynecologic cancer. We all now know with, with decades of genomic understanding expansion that that gynecologic cancer, you know, ovary and endometrium is highly clinically and biologically diverse, and we need to target our developments, uh, preclinical model development to match these, and to really to identify area of greatest clinical need. And drug repurposing screen is actually a rational first step, you know, especially when you consider how long it would take to, to bring a novel drug candidate actually into clinical use. And also a more favorable pharmacoeconomics. The Joxin is seventy-five dollar a month. The uh, immunotherapy drug, most of them range, you know, is maybe up to thirty thousand a month, uh, which is why uh, in BC Cancer, where I worked before, um, the drug expense budget is actually seventy percent of operating budget in BC Cancers. The other reason why we want to study these these more aggressive type endometrial cancer, it might shed insights into more common type of endometrial cancer or brain cancer. Here is our methylation analysis where we run a supervised cluster based on low thio genes that are more differentially methylated between differentiated can tumor component and inflammation and component. We superimpose on the TCGA cohort, which um, not surprisingly, none of the tumor shows similar pattern of uh, uh, methylation pullback because TCGA cohort did not include the differentiated cancer. But what was interesting to see is that in the differentiation sort of uh, uh, differentiated tumor methylation signature, there was some gradation in actually uh, methylation signatures uh, uh, in, 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 in the expression profile. So we proposed this uh, potential, you know, candidate Mueller in epithelial differentiation signature, and we ran a survival analysis uh, using the cutoff determined by uh, a AUC analysis. And, uh, and, and tumors that shows a higher, uh, not a better differentiated with higher differentiation methylation score, they, they, uh, the patient do considerably better actually than tumors, uh, than patients with tumors who actually that does exhibit a lower methylation score, like that more poorly differentiated. So it's quite interesting that we're able to use the knowledge we gain, insight we gain from studying the differentiated and mitral cancer and apply that, at least in the prognostic setting. But actually what would be more exciting would be to 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 look at um, the, the gene set that uh, differentially methylated uh, in this methylation, uh, differentiation, differentiation uh, 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 sort of methylation signatures and, and, and look for additional therapeutic insights as well. So uh, lastly, but more importantly, I want to thank actually the, the, the our, our funders, uh, particularly the Sauron Baldwin family that supported the ovarian cancer research here position. And most importantly, the patient partners who donated tissues, who participated in our studies. 
uh, I also want to acknowledge the, the collaborator, especially the ones uh, listed in red here uh, from, from Calgary, from, BC, from Vancouver, and from Saskatchewan uh, who made this uh, work possible. And these uh, pictures, photos are some of our collaborators. Thank you very much. I'm happy to take any questions or Thank you very much, Dr. Lee. Um, I would ask people to think about their questions after that fascinating talk. I know for me, I particularly appreciate it as a public health person, your pragmatic approach, both in terms, uh, particularly around exploring the possibilities of existing drugs. I'm excited about that $75 a month cost, drug cost versus the 30,000 of immunotherapy. So really, um, appreciate that and appreciate your talk. So we will have time for questions at the end, but now I'd like to introduce Dr. Jessica Dennis, who is assistant professor in the Department of Medical Genetics at the University of British Columbia and an investigator with BC Children's Hospital Research Institute. Dr. Dennis is a genetic epidemiologist and she applies computational methods to large scale genomic and population health data to identify the basis of human health and disease disease. She uses a life course perspective that works to understand how genes and the environment contribute to health and disease from the moment of conception onwards um, to variation in susceptibility to disease, response to treatment, and recovery. So this is um, steps forward to developing precision patient-centered care. And one of the goals of her research is to elucidate the biological mechanisms underlying psychiatric conditions, which as we know, vary considerably uh, in, in their uh, manifestation across the life course and also between males and females. Dr. Dennis completed postdoctoral training at Vanderbilt University Medical Center in Nashville, Tennessee, and holds a PhD from the University of Toronto, where she was a fellow in the interdisciplinary CIR stage program. Um, Dr. Dennis, please go ahead. Great. Thank you for the introduction. Um, good morning, good afternoon, everybody. Before I get started into the meat of um, of my presentation about major depressive disorder and loneliness in sex-specific associations with coronary artery disease. Uh, my understanding is that we have a, a quite a diverse audience joining us today, and so I wanted to just pause and get us all on the same page about what it is uh, an epidemiologist and a genetic epidemiologist does. And let me advance. There we go. So for me, at least, a silver lining of the pandemic was that people uh, finally started to understand what it was that epidemiologists do. I know before the pandemic, when I would tell people that I was an epidemiologist, um, they would often think about the epidermis and, and ask me if I did something with the skin. But post pandemic, um, there was a greater understanding that, that we did something about disease modeling. But I wanna emphasize that epidemiologists do more than just infectious disease modeling. Um, my lab doesn't do anything with infectious disease. We study mental health conditions, psychiatric conditions. And actually what we do is we sit at a screen all day and analyze data. So more formally, get my screen advancing. Epidemiology is the study of how often diseases occur in different groups of people and why, and it's not restricted to infectious disease. Now there's many different types of epidemiology and epidemiologists. I am an epi a genetic epidemiologist, which is the study of how genetic factors influence human traits and diseases in families and in populations. Genetic epidemiology is built on a tradition of rare single gene diseases and family-based studies. You can see that on the right-hand side of your screen, the example of sickle cell anemia where it's a trait that's caused by mutation in a single gene. But much of what we study now in genetic epidemiology is complex or multifactorial disease, which is in the figure on the right-hand side, or the left-hand side of, of that panel there. Um, an example would be coronary artery disease, where you've got many genomic variants, which we call polygenic uh, condition or polygenic trait, interacting with environmental factors to influence somebody's susceptibility to disease. 
Major advances in genetic epidemiology over the last 15 years have been driven by this explosion of biomedical research, biomedical data captured in biobanks. And I know biobanks, when I, when I say biobanks to people, it means different things to different people. For me, at least, a biobank is a repository of biospecimens like blood from which you can derive genotype data, especially the type of, of biobank that I'm interested in. And these biospecimens are linked to phenotypic data. So this would be data from questionnaires or uh, what I really like to work with is electronic health record data. And biobanks are incredibly powerful because they, they enable this data-driven approach to quantifying, characterizing, and understanding the relationships between biospecimens and the medical phenome. Biobanks that you might've heard of, the, definitely the biggest ones in this space currently um, are the UK Biobank, which has over 500,000 participants in it, um, and 23andMe. And both of these, so 23andMe is the direct-to-consumer genetic testing company, uh, and they often collaborate with researchers. And I use data from both of these biobanks in this project on, on loneliness and depression and coronary artery disease that I'm going to get into. The bread and butter of what we do as genetic epidemiologists is genome-wide association study, or GWAS for short. And in case you're not familiar with this study design, this schematic kind of walks you through all the different steps. So you start with data collection, and this, this could be the data collection that happens in a biobank. You genotype your participants. You do an element of quality control that considers people's genetic ancestry. Um, you might have to do some element of imputation to take into account that different genetic variants would be differently measured in different people. And then you test the association. So at 9 million, for 9 million genetic variants across the genome, you can see across the x-axis here in panel E, this would be like 9 million genetic variants that you've tested for association with your phenotype of interest. And then panel F, you meta-analyze meta and replicate. Now, this study design has been incredibly su uh, successful. You can see in this animation, these are the genetic variants that have been associated with different phenotypes across the human genome. So each vertical bar is a chromosome and each dot is a genome-wide significant association between uh, a genetic variant at that position and a different phenotype of interest. And the different colors are telling you the different phenotypes. And in that time lapse, you saw that over the last uh, I think it was between 2016, 2006 and 2019, how many associations this GWAS study design have, has identified. And the thing that you might be starting to appreciate by now is that you can do a GWAS of just about any trait. If you've measured, measured genetic variation and you've measured some element of, of the phenotype, then you can test that association. And the GWAS that I was involved in that I wanna share with you today is a GWAS of loneliness. Now we all heard a lot about loneliness during the pandemic and, and there were even um, pockets where loneliness was, was being thought about very seriously at, um, from a public health standpoint before the pandemic. But to put us all on the same page, uh, let me tell you that loneliness is a feeling of discontent with so social, social connections. And this is a subjective feeling. And in that, I want to distinguish it from social isolation, which is something that's measured objectively. 22% of adults are chronically lonely, and there's unclear sex differences. But loneliness is associated with a 38% increased risk of early mortality. In comparison, major depressive disorder is a feeling with, of discontent with life in general. It's got a 17% lifetime prevalence. It's twice as common in women compared to men, and it's associated with a 71% increase of early mortality. Loneliness can lead to depression, but they're co-occurring only about 40% of the time. So I want to emphasize that these are distinct conditions or distinct traits, distinct phenotypes. So I did a GWAS of loneliness by collaborating with data from the, using data from the UK Biobank and collaborating with researchers from 23andMe. We had over 500,000 participants in our GWAS of loneliness. 
And we found 16 independent and significant loci. And by that, I mean genetic regions where the genetic variants in that region were significantly associated with somebody's subjective feelings of loneliness. And you can see those regions as the, the green dots that are appearing above the red line. So those are our 16 regions of the genome that are significantly associated with loneliness. So we've done our GWAS. I told you that was the bread and butter of what genetic epidemiologists do. Um, so now what, what else do we do? Well, a panel that I had hidden when I was walking you through the study design of a GWAS was this panel H, the post GWAS analysis. And in my opinion, this is where the real fun begins and where biobanks shine. So we looked at our GWAS results and we asked ourselves, why are feelings of loneliness associated with a 38% increased risk of early mortality? We knew this from the epidemiological literature that loneliness increases the risk of early mortality. And we said, can our GWAS help us understand this early mortality better? So for example, our two hypotheses were that maybe it was genetic pleiotropy where these genetic variants that were associated with feelings of loneliness were the same genetic variants that, that predisposed people to coronary artery disease or other complex diseases that manifest later in life. Or maybe it was comorbidity. Was it that, that somebody's genetic risk for loneliness and feeling lonely caused certain health behaviors that subsequently increased somebody's risk of, of, of early mortality? So to tease apart these two different situations, we turn to an electronic health record linked biobank. And this work was done using data, the biobank from Vanderbilt University Medical Center, which is where I was a postdoc at the time. And as an epidemiologist, this was, this was a, a, a sandbox. This was a dream data set to work with. There were 2.8 million patient electronic health records, EHRs, covering 10 years on average. And these electronic health records included clinic notes, medication data, lab data, demographic data, registries, vital statistics, billing codes, and outpatient encounters. And all of this was de-identified and pushed into this research data warehouse. And 10% of these samples, 10% of these, these patients had a linked DNA sample. And so using this biobank data, this Vanderbilt University Medical Center biobank data, we took everybody who had genetic information and we calculated a polygenic score. And some of you might know what a polygenic score is, um, but again, to, to recognize the potential diversity of the audience, I'll put us all on the same page. Polygenic scores are allelic sums weighted by effect estimates from a GWAS. So on the left-hand side, you can see there, these would be results from our GWAS of loneliness. And the way that data is structured is you've got one row for each, for each genetic variant or each SNP, and that row consists of an identifier for the SNP and the effect size. So how strongly that genetic variant or that SNP is associated with the risk of feeling lonely. And then on the right-hand side, this is the data you'd have in your biobank. So this is the data we had for our participants in the Vanderbilt University Medical Center biobank. And for each patient, we calculated their polygenic score by taking the effect estimate for SNP1, the allele effect for SNP1, times the number of copies of SNP1, 0, 1, or 2, plus the effect estimate for SNP2, times the number of copies that this, partici this participant had of SNP2, and so on, so that you're summing over all of the genetic variants that a participant has and weighting them by the strength of their effect in a discovery GWAS population. So the big takeaway here, in case you didn't track with that math, is that polygenic scores quantify, let me just move my box, they quantify an individual's polygenic risk for a trait. And they can be calculated on anyone with genotype data. So to emphasize, I didn't have any information on loneliness on people in the Vanderbilt Biobank, but we calculated their polygenic score for loneliness using this strategy. With those polygenic scores in hand, we now conducted another 
WAS study, like a GWAS, but this time it was called a FIWAS or a phenome-wide association study. So on the GWAS side, you can see we looked at the relationship between the entire genome and uh, a single phenotype. But a FIWAS flips that design on its head. So in a FIWAS, you're looking at the relationship between a limited set of genetic factors. So in this case, it was a polygenic score. And we were examining the association between that polygenic score and a large number of different phenotypes. So this was the phenome. And the FIWAS design can help distinguish comorbidity from genetic pleiotropy, which if you recall, was a major goal of what we were trying to do. So these are results of the FIWAS of a polygenic score for loneliness in the Vanderbilt Biobank. And to orient you to this plot on the x-axis here, these are the different diagnoses, medical diagnoses that, um, that are in the, the EHRs of participants in the biobank, just grouped by um, different disease type. And the y-axis, that's the strength of association of those conditions with the polygenic score for loneliness. And you can see associations that you would expect. So having a higher polygenic score for loneliness also increased the likelihood that you would also have a major depressive disorder diagnosis, a tobacco use disorder. Um, and then I couldn't quite tell you what this other pink mental disorder is just at the, the threshold for statistical significance. But the result that was somewhat unexpected was that we were also getting this really strong signal for circulatory system conditions like ischemic heart disease and coronary atherosclerosis. And so we wanted to, we were then wondering whether this was, again, evidence of genetic pleiotropy or comorbidity due to non-genetic risk factors that were shared between loneliness and coronary artery disease, like smoking. So we developed a, a machine learning model for coronary artery disease to get a better disease definition for coronary artery disease. And then we did a, a very fine-tuned genetic epidemiological analysis by controlling for different conventional heart disease risk factors and seeing if it attenuated the relationship between a polygenic score for loneliness and coronary artery disease. And so in this panel here, you're going to see this is, this is the odds ratio for coronary artery disease associated with the polygenic score for loneliness that we initially found in a minimally adjusted model with just age, sex, and different genetic quality control parameters. But then we added in different conventional heart disease risk factors to see if that strength of association stayed the same or whether it was attenuated. And you can see as I populate this graph that none of these conventional risk factors were attenuating the signal, which is telling us that it's more likely that this association is due to genetic pleiotropy where the same genetic variants that were predisposing people to feeling lonely were also the same genetic variants that were increasing somebody's risk for coronary artery disease. And it wasn't due to, to, due to comorbidity i.e. shared um, lifestyle factors like smoking or type 2 diabetes or BMI. Finally, we did a sex stratified analysis where we looked at the genetic risk factors that were shared between major depressive disorder and loneliness and those that were unique to major depressive disorder and those were, that were unique to loneliness. And the way that this is um, this is shown is with a, a conditional sign here. So here on the left-hand side, these are the results for a polygenic score for major depressive disorder after removing the genetic variants that were also associated with loneliness, because we know major depressive disorder and loneliness are co-occurring and share some genetic risk factors. And this plot here, you don't necessarily have to focus on the numbers, but just the plot looks the same as what I showed you on the other, on the other slide, where if we have an odds ratio greater than one, it's telling us that there is an association and an odds ratio centered on one is telling us that there's no association. And so the major depressive disorder polygenic score after removing the genetic variants that were also associated with loneliness was no longer associated with coronary artery disease. Whereas here on the right-hand side, the polygenic score for loneliness after removing the genetic variants that were also associated with major depressive disorder, these are the genetic variants that were associated with 
a higher risk of coronary artery disease, and especially in females, and less so in males. Now, I know when I set out on this project, I was a bit skeptical that we'd find anything about the genetic risk for loneliness. And it was only when I considered it through an evolutionary lens that I really understood how these results were consistent with the evolutionary function of loneliness. So in case you thought everything that I showed you was, you know, just fishing, a fishing expedition, or, um, you know, if you're skeptical of the GWAS design, maybe this will help convince you. Humans are among many social species who have evolved to depend on each other. And loneliness serves as a painful alert that you're on the social perimeter. So it makes sense that there would be some genetic variants that are associated with this feeling. And loneliness triggers different physiological effects. It triggers depress depressive symptoms, it disrupts sleep, raises your blood pressure, and activates the HPA axis. And so again, this is all logical that we might see some um, whole body consequences of the genetic variants for loneliness. Now, I'd like to switch gears in the last five or so minutes of my talk um, and talk about some new research that I'm doing in the lab. And this new research uh, that, that Tamil alluded to in the introduction is based on the life course. And it's really motivated by the observation that psychiatric conditions, most of what I've studied in the lab, they're dynamic over the life course. So take depression, for example. There are huge inter-individual differences in when depressive episodes develop. There's people who develop early onset depression. There's people who develop peripartum depression. Um, there's late onset depression. And then there's people who ex experience recurrent episodes throughout their life course. But most of what we do in genetic epidemiology, think of those GWAS, just collapses all of this life course heterogeneity into a single yes or no, have you ever experienced depression? And so my lab really wants to understand how the genetics that we are conceived with, because your genotype doesn't change over the life course, how your genotype affects that heterogeneity and phenotype manifestation across the life course. And our motivation for doing this is that analysis of genetic effects on changes in phenotypes over time could uncover novel biology. And if we're gonna use genetics to advance precision health, then we must address this heterogeneity in time course. And finally, the time is right. And I do intend that that is a pun, um, that we have lots of big biobanks with longitudinal data now that are only gonna accrue more longitudinal data with the passage of time. So for the next few slides, I'm gonna show you some preliminary data that we've generated from the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging, which is um, one of Canada's largest biobank studies. And I apologize for the blurriness of this slide, um, but let me walk you through the highlights of this study. So the Canadian Longitudinal Study on Aging includes a, a tracking cohort and a comprehensive cohort. The comprehensive cohort has genotype data on up to 30,000 participants. And these participants were recruited um, at baseline in 2011, and then they've been followed up multiple times every three years thereafter. And right now we've been working with data from baseline, follow up one, and then just fresh off, fresh off the press, just released data from follow up two. And this, I guess I should say this data set too. So um, the comprehensive cohort, we have genotype data on participants, as well as really de detailed questionnaire data at multiple time point and time points, no EHR data, no electronic health record data, but really detailed questionnaire data on participants. Adopting this life course perspective, um, a, a talented grad student, graduate student in my lab, Karin Veer, um, has been working to tease apart how depressive symptoms change in these older adults over time. And so he, he applied um, a growth mixture modeling approach to tease apart different subgroups of trajectories and found that in these 24,000 Canadians who are aged 45 to 85 at baseline, these are different patterns with which their depressive symptoms changed over time. And so the classes here 
You can see these are the number of people in each of these classes. Depressive symptoms were measured using the CESD-10, and there's a group that has sort of just barely clinically significant symptoms that increase over time, a group that has subthreshold symptoms that slowly increase over time, and then a stable group, and then a group that two groups that have resolving symptoms over time. And there are some sex differences here. You can see the solid line. The solid line in all of these plots is the males and the dotted line are the females. And one thing that you might've noticed is that in these two groups where the symptoms resolve, the, res the resolution is a lot more significant in the males than it is in the females. And so in our exploratory data analysis using the CLSA, we wanted to know what correlates with these trajectory memberships. I'll skip over the sex and maybe I'll jump right to the, the, the punchy bit about loneliness because we've been talking so much about loneliness. So here we've got um, different prevalence estimates of loneliness in the different trajectory groups. So trajectory one is the group with the, the worsening depressive symptoms. And you can see that this is the group that reports the greatest prevalence of loneliness and that there are some sex differences. You can see males and females have been stratified here. So again, this is just you know, really new results that my student worked hard to generate for me over the weekend, but we wanted to understand what could be correlating with these, these uh, trajectories. So I'll skip through the final slides um, of, our, of our preliminary data analysis. I'm happy to return to them and just get to the take home messages here. So I showed you a story of dying of a broken heart by, um, to put it in lay layperson's terms, that the genetic factors that associate with loneliness uniquely associate with coronary artery disease risk compared to the genetic factors that associated that associate with major depressive disorder. Humans are dynamic over time and big biobanks with longitudinal data can help us better understand heterogeneity across the time course. Finally, understanding how genetic variation contributes to inter-individual inter differences and changes over time could improve precision medicine. Finally, I'd just like to thank um, my team, um, as well as uh, my colleagues at Vanderbilt University, where a lot of that initial loneliness work was done. And thank you for having me this morning and this afternoon. Thanks so much, Dr. Dennis. Um, again, uh, we're at a little over time for the talk. So we'll, unless there's anything burning that someone needs to put in the chat now for clarification, we'll move on and then we can have a longer time for discussion with all the panelists. So I'm just looking and there isn't anything coming through. So thanks very much, Dr. Dennis. And now I'm going to turn to our third speaker, who is Dr. Mohammed Akbari. He's an associate professor at the Dalalana School of Public Health at the University of Toronto and a scientist with Women's College Research Institute at Women's College Hospital. He's also an adjunct faculty member at the Institute of Medical Science, Faculty of Medicine at the U of T, and the director of the Molecular Genetics Research Laboratory at Women's College Hospital. His interest is studying genetic susceptibility to cancers, including breast, ovarian, esophageal, colon, pancreas, and prostate cancers. This includes identifying new genes responsible for hereditary cancers, defining the role of known cancer genes, and individualizing cancer treatment for patients carrying a genetic mutation. One of his most recent works published in American Journal of Human Genetics identified ATRIP as a novel breast cancer susceptibility gene. Another key focus of his research program, which he's going to speak to us about today, are strategies for reducing cancer burden by improving the current models of offering genetic screening for hereditary cancers. So the SCREEN project, which he co-leads, studies the feasibility of population-based screening for hereditary breast and ovarian cancers in Canada. Dr. Akbari, please go ahead. Oh, you're still on mute, so we're not hearing you. Great. Sorry about that. Yeah, 
Thank you, Tamil, for the introduction. Uh, I'm very honored to be here today to talk about uh, one of the topics uh, our team at Women's College Hospital at the University of Toronto uh, has been working on, which is population-based genetic testing for hereditary, uh, hereditary cancer. And uh, one of the most recent projects our team working on, which is the screen project. Okay. So cancer results from accumulation of genetic changes in the cells to the point that cell proliferation uh, goes uh, uncontrolled and change a normal cell to a tumor cell. Uh, however, in some cells or individuals uh, carry some mutation inherited from their parents that prone them to uh, developing those genetic changes uh, more than usual. And because of that, those people uh, are prone to developing cancer in younger ages comparing to uh, other cancer patients. That's named hereditary cancer. It's estimated that about 10 to 15 percent of all cancers are hereditary, and that number, you know, is different from cancer to cancer. For example, for breast cancer, that number is about 10 percent, and for ovarian cancer, it's estimated about 20 percent of them uh, are hereditary. Uh, about 130 different cancer susceptibility genes uh, have been reported, you know, in the last two, three, three decades that we have started, you know, looking for those genes. Those genes mainly involve in maintaining our genome named characteristic genes that usually involve in repairing the DNA or involve uh, in controlling the cell cycle and avoiding the cell with, uh, you know, genetic changes, go through uh, cell division and those genes called gatekeepers. Uh, so uh, one of the first uh, identified breast cancer susceptibility gene was BRCA1, reported back in 1994, uh, and it's a well-established known uh, breast and ovarian cancer susceptibility genes. Uh, and one of the latest uh, genes that are reported to be associated with hereditary breast cancer uh, is ATRI, that our international uh, group of scientists reported earlier this year, and recently uh, a group uh, from Breast Cancer Consortium uh, also uh, validated and confirmed association of atrial mutation with the odds ratio of about three for uh, breast cancer. So you might want to ask why hereditary cancer is important. So uh, it's important because uh, understanding the genes associated with hereditary cancer and identifying people who carry a mutation in those genes will help us uh, to reduce uh, the burden and mortality of cancers in general through prevention, through you know uh, prophylactic surgeries, through early diagnosis. For example, uh, we can. Uh, put people who carry the mutation uh, for one of those uh, cancer susceptibility genes on intensive screening and diagnose their cancer in earlier stages when we have a better chance for treating them. And also uh, for some of hereditary uh, you know, cancers with certain mutation in uh, some specific genes, we have some targeted treatments that those people uh, will respond to those drugs uh, better. And that, you know, better it is not limited to only the people who carry a mutation in those hereditary cancer genes. The knowledge that we, you know, obtain through studying those cancer susceptibility genes will also help us to understand the pathogenesis of cancer in general. And sometimes it might, you know, help us to develop better treatment for all cancers in general. And there are some examples of it, and I don't want to get to the details of the details of it. So uh, I told you that uh, there are uh, about 130 different genes that are reported to be associated with different hereditary cancers. Among them, BRC1 and BRC2 are most commonly known and one of the first genes that reported to be associated with risk of mainly breast and ovarian cancer. However, we know that individuals who carry mutation in those genes also have a higher risk of developing pancreatic cancer and prostate cancer. For 
for example, for br uh, breast cancer um, patients, uh, depending to the population we have studies, about four to 28% of breast cancer patients uh, have a mutation in one of the BRC1 and BRC2 mutation and individuals who have a mutation in one of those genes, again, dependent to the gene, they would have a lifetime risk of developing breast cancer uh, of anywhere between 50 to 80%. And that's the same story for ovarian, um, you know, prostate and pancreatic cancer, however, with different, uh, you know, lifetime risk and percentage. Uh, so the current model that we have in place in Canada and most uh, other countries around the world for offering genetic testing for hereditary uh, you know, cancer is based uh, on identifying high risk group. It means the group who have a higher chance of carrying a mutation in those genes and then uh, offer genetic testing to them. For example, here in Canada, uh, when a patient diagnosed or there is any indication of hereditary cancer, such as a uh, family history of cancer, Answer, that individual need to be referred by the family physician to the you know genetic counselor and the genetic counselor we do pre-test genetic counseling and if the person meets certain criteria will be referred for genetic testing and then the result will be disclosed uh, you know to the patient this process could take anywhere between one month to sometimes over one year in different regions uh, in the country. Uh, and one of the main reasons for that is uh, the number of the cancer genetics clinics that we have available you know, through the country. If you look at uh, the distribution of cancer genetics clinics uh, in Canada, you will see you know, in some regions, for example, in Ontario, Alberta, or Quebec, we might have a, you know, a large group of those clinics Clinics. However, in other regions in the country, uh, those cancer uh, clinics are very limited and the access to those clinics sometimes takes uh, a very long you know, waiting time. Um, so this approach, the current model, as I told you, is based on Harris Group's, uh, you know, approach, which developed in mid '90s when BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes uh, identified, and that was based on a very high cost of genetic testing at the time, which was about three thousand to four thousand, and a relatively cheaper genetic counseling, uh, you know, services cost at the time, and also the little knowledge we had. Uh, about more than two decades ago uh, about uh, this topic, both in the public and also among uh, the healthcare providers. Uh, there are, you know, a range of gaps in this model. I, I just, uh, you know, listed them here. So the first thing is that uh, our genetic counseling resources are really limited in Canada and also in other places around the world. And because of that, uh, we have a very, in some regions, very long waiting, uh, you know, time for receiving the pre-test genetic counseling and identifying if people meet the criteria for offering genetic testing. And the second problem is that uh, no matter how good our criteria, uh, you know, are, uh, still there are some carriers who do not, will not, you know, meet the criteria. And uh, if we want to go uh, with selecting people with gen for genetic testing through those criteria, we will miss those carriers. And uh, also not everybody who meet those criteria will be referred for genetic testing. Uh, there are several, uh, you know, reports around the country uh, that uh, reported underutilization of genetic testing. For example, right now in most jurisdictions here in Canada, all ovarian cancer patients are qualified for genetic testing, uh, while the report showed, for example, in 2015 from uh, uh, London, uh, Ontario, that only seven percent of ovarian cancer patients refer for genetic testing. And more recent report from Alberta reported that only 19 percent of those patients, you know, referred for genetic testing, while all of ovarian cancer are qualified for that. The other problem with this current model is that those are mostly patient-centric. What that means, it means that we wait till people diagnose with cancer, which is too late. You know, we want to identify people who carry mutation in cancer susceptibility genes at the point that they have not been diagnosed with the cancer and we can offer something to them in order to reduce their risk of developing cancer. And also, even in those, uh, you know, uh, who diagnosed with cancer and qualified for genetic testing based on the uh, certain criteria that we have in 
place. Again, we refer them for genetic testing after completing their course of treatment. Uh, while it's too late for them to use uh, the information about the carrier status for guiding their treatment. And we believe uh, that it's time we switch from high risk uh, you know, group uh, screening approach to population-based approach. And uh, we have uh, the tools required for that switch. First of all, the reduced test price from $3,000 to $4,000. Now the cost of genetic testing reduced to $200 to $300. Right now we have a good knowledge about the subject, both in the public and also among the physician. And there are more demand for uh, genetic testing for cancer susceptibility genes and our genetic counseling resources actually cannot, uh, you know, handle that. And on top of that, we have mature online services that can help us for this, you know, population based screening approach. So basically, in 1990s, uh, with the high risk group screening approach we developed, we uh, were we have been doing pretest genetic counseling for identifying people who have a higher risk for carrying a mutation and then offer them genetic testing. We believe that in 2020, we need just to switch, uh, you know, and uh, offer genetic testing to everybody at a certain point in their life and identify those who carry the mutation and then refer them for post uh, 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 test genetic counseling. Those are the group who require genetic counseling the most and let uh, focus our genetic counseling resources on those, uh, on that group who need it the most. So by doing that, switching from a uh, high risk group to population based, uh, you know, screening, uh, there will be no need for in person genetic, uh, you know, pre test counseling. So we will remove the problem of access to genetic counseling and we can offer pre test genetic counseling uh, through some tools, you know, online. So uh, no mutation carrier will be, you know, left unidentified because everybody will, uh, you know, receive genetic testing. People will know if we start this early in their life, they will know if they carry a mutation or not before they've been diagnosed with cancer. And of course, if they diagnose with cancer at the time of diagnosis, they will know if they carry a mutation or not. And that knowledge about their mutation carrier status would uh, help uh, their um, healthcare providers for guiding their treatment and offer them the best possible, uh, you know, treatment available. So based on that, our team at Women's College Hospital started an initiative called the Screen Project um, to basically a study the feasibility of population-based genetic uh, testing. We started the phase one of this study in 2017 and run it for over a year and made the genetic testing for BRC1 and BRC2 genes only available to all Canadians over the age 18. Uh, and we offered a pre-test genetic counseling through uh, some documents that made available through the landing page of the website. And there was no one-on-one -on -one, uh, pre test genetic counseling and the tests uh, were paid out of pocket at a reasonable cost of 165 US dollar. So uh, we decided to limit the first uh, the phase of the study to only screening BRC1 and BRC2 to three main reasons. First of all, uh, the high penetrance of the, you know, the genes. It means that if somebody carry a mutation in one of the BRC1 and BRC2 genes, they would have a very high risk of developing certain uh, cancers. And also the enough knowledge about uh, the pathogenicity of the mutation that we identify in those genes and also relatively high mutation frequency in the population. If you look at the, the you know, chart at the bottom of this slide, you will see that across different you know, databases, the population uh, frequency of carrying a pathogenic mutation in one of the BRC1 and BRC2 mutation is almost half a percent. So basically from every 200 individual, one of them carry a mutation in one of the BRC1 and BRC2 genes. So based on that, we thought, okay, BRC1 and BRC2 is probably a um, good point to start for offering the population-based genetic testing. So people went to the landing page of this study, uh, 
sign the consent form, fill the questionnaire, then uh, a saliva kit mailed to their address. They put you know, their saliva in the kit, send it back to the laboratory, and they receive the results you know, in two to four uh, weeks. And uh, people received three different, uh, you know, test results. Uh, a majority of people received the negative results. A smaller proportion uh, of them received uh, a positive test results. It means that carrying a mutation in one of the BRC1 and BRC2 genes that might increase their risk of developing breast and ovarian cancer and also pancreatic and prostate cancer. And also uh, another group of people received uh, results of a variant of uncertain significance. It means uh, we do not have enough info information about the um, importance of the variants detected in that individual. And we don't know if it's a benign mutation or it's a pathogenic mutation. Um, so in the phase one, um, about 3,400 individuals signed the consent form. Of those, about half of them completed the study questionnaire and uh, the genetic test result issued for 1,269 of them. And here you see the distribution of the ethnic background of the individual. About 70% of them uh, self-reported to be Caucasian, uh, and a smaller group were French Canadian, and then we had Jewish East Asian uh, and indigenous South Asian, Middle Eastern, Hispanic, and also if uh, Africans. Um, so uh, about 22% of the those individuals who tested in the phase one had the personal history of cancer and the most frequent cancer among them were breast cancer. And of course, a, a strong majority uh, of those individuals had a family history of cancer. So of those 269 who were tested in the phase one of this study, uh, 1,188 of them received the negative test results. Uh, about 4% of them, 51 individual received VUS results. And we had 30 individual who carry a pathogenic or likely pathogenic mutation in one of the BRC1 and BRC2 mutation. Of those 30 carriers, 23 of them uh, meet the provincial you know, criteria for genetic testing and seven of them did not meet any criteria. And if it was not through the screen project, those were, you know, uh, left unidentified till they, you know, diagnosed with uh, cancer. So here is, you know, some of the example, for example, this uh, lady here at age 39, because of the family history of ovarian cancer in her mom at age 44, she wanted to be tested for BRC1 and BRC2, and she turned out to be carrier, and she was denied genetic testing because of lack of uh, pathologic confirmation of ovarian cancer in her mom. This was another example of um, a man who had a 50% uh, chance of carrying a known uh, family mutation. However, uh, because of you know being busy in the life and not have time to go through the process, never got a chance to test himself. And the screen project was an opportunity for him uh, to send his sample for testing and turn out that he uh, carried the mutation. So um, what one of the main point of you know population genetic testing is that people take action for reducing their risk of developing you know cancer and if only identifying people without taking any action for reducing their risk, there will be no benefit to any you know, population-based genetic testing. So here we uh, evaluated the 20 uh, out of the three carriers in the first phase who were female. We could access 17 of them. Of those 17, six of them had breast cancer at the time of diagnosis. One of them unfortunately passed away um, during the time of the testing to follow up. And the other five, Five, all five did bilateral mastectomy or scheduled for bilateral mastectomy and also completed salpengi, uh, salpengo or phorectomy. And this is, you know, uh, really promising. Of the 11 uh, individual women who were unaffected at the time of genetic testing, two of them diagnosed with uh, breast cancer uh, by the time of, you know, follow-up. And both of them did bilateral mastectomy and bilateral salpengo or phorectomy. And of the nine who were still you know unaffected um 
five of them did bilat prophylactic bilateral mastectomy or scheduled for bilateral mastectomy. And all five also uh, had bilateral sulfingolophrectomy. And uh, the other four uh, decided to do intensive screening by MRI. So here you will see that 12 out of 16 individual who carry the mutation, female individual, uh, about 75% of them and preventive, uh, you know, prophylactic uh, surgeries. We also, in our uh, follow-up, ask about the satisfaction uh, of the, you know, all 30 carriers, 18 of them responded, 94% of them, 17 of them were highly satisfied with the process. And we also send a um, follow-up questionnaire about satisfaction uh, of the process to 400 of uh, non-carriers and 140 of them responded. And again, 89% of them were highly satisfied with the study. We ask people uh, that how we can improve, uh, you know, the program. And these are the top uh, three suggestions, faster turnaround time, because our turnaround time for the first fight was almost four weeks from the time that we received receive the saliva sa samples. They also, uh, you know, repeatedly asking us, they like to be tested for more genes uh, than BRCA1 and BRCA2. And also uh, many of people said that they like to improve the visibility of this study because they only heard about it from their uh, healthcare providers. And they like to, you know, uh, to see that the screen project uh, is more widely, uh, you know, advertised in the community. So we got all those, uh, you know, suggestion, and then we started the phase two of the study in mid 2020. Uh, so in this step, we reduced the turnaround time significantly. So now the turnaround time from the time that we received the uh, saliva sample is less than seven business days. Uh, and also we, uh, people initially will receive a report on BRC1 and BRC2 genes. However, after that, they have an option for asking to receive additional reporting uh, on uh, additional 43 uh, actionable cancer susceptibility genes. As you see here, we covered the majority of those uh, high, uh, bullet are basically all confirmed breast cancer susceptibility genes such as ATM board one pal b2 uh, so uh, as of September 15, uh, you know, about uh, four days ago, uh, we uh, tested 1,144 individuals, uh, about 1,079 of them were women and 65 were men. Uh, about 84% of those individuals, after receiving the initial report on BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes, requested reporting on additional 43 genes. Uh, and out of the 1144 that we tested, we found pathogenic or likely pathogenic in, uh, you know, 88 individuals, so 8% mutation frequency rate. And very interestingly, 66% uh, of those 88 carriers, so 58 of them, did not meet Ontario criteria, which is one of the, uh, you know, uh, more inclusive criteria uh, for genetic testing. And this is very important. And you will see here the difference comparing to the first phase. In the first phase, seven of the 30 carriers uh, did not meet the criteria, which is about, you know, 20, 25%. But here, 58 of the 88, which is about, you know, 66 to 70%. And one reason is because of the number of the mutation carriers that are identified in genes other than BRCA1 and BRCA2. If you look at the distribution of the, you know, the genes that carry the mutation. So on top of the list, we had BRCA2, then check to BRCA1, ATM, PALB2, HOX, B1. And um, the current criteria that we have in place for offering genetic testing is based on the, B the BRCA1 and BRCA2 genes. And that's why we see in the first, uh, in the second phase, when we added more genes uh, to the panel, more, you know, people 
people identified to carry mutation in other genes uh, who do not you know, qualify for provincially covered genetic testing. And 18 of the 88 carriers, 20% of them, uh, you had the personal history of the cancer. And as you see here, the distribution of the tested individual, you will see, although the bulk of them are fr from Ontario, but we have uh, basically from every single province, we had some patients. And if you're curious to know how they hear about the, the screen project, you will see the majority of them referred from their general counselor, but many of them also found about the screen project through the internet search and social media. So in summary, if I want to summarize our experience with the screen project is that population screening is feasible, uh, has a higher yield of uh, you know, mutation detection, uh, as we show in the both phase of the screen project. It eliminates all the challenges we have currently for you know, pre-test genetic counseling and cascade genetic testing after identifying somebody carrying mutation and wanting to you know, test the family members. And uh, because of population genetic testing, we can offer this in early uh, you know, stage of life, we can identify people before they diagnose with cancer. And also if unfortunately any of them diagnosed with cancer, at the type of diagnosis, they will know that they, you know, uh, have a mutation. So uh, I really appreciate Dr. Stephen Nera, uh, the co-lead on the screen project. Uh, Angelina Tryon is a genetic counselor on the uh, second phase of the screen project. And Nicole Dugochka was a genetic counselor on the first phase. And also Dr. Metcalf and Dr. Kofsopoulos uh, are other two scientists in our hereditary cancer research unit at Women's College Hospital. And I sincerely appreciate appreciate Women's College Hospital, Women's College Research Institute, and Peter Gilgan Center for Women's Cancers uh, for uh, supporting the screen project financially and logistically. Um, thank you so much for your attention. And um, yeah, we'll be happy to answer the questions if there is any. Thank you very much, Dr. Akbari. Um, and I would welcome the other panelists to likewise uh, turn on their screens and come back um, with us and for the audience to let us know if you have questions for anyone or all of the speakers in the chat or similarly you can um, put up your hand, but while you get, there's not much time for questions, but I'll give you just a moment to think about what your questions would be by asking all of the panelists if they could share with us what they think the real, um, the area of personalized medicine or genomic research that's going to allow us to really move the dial in women's health over the next 10 years. Like where is the evidence to move the dial on outcomes? And we have heard examples spoken about here today. I think uh, you all gave concrete examples about moving the dial, but from a broader reflection, uh, where do you think is the real promise? Um, and perhaps I could start with you, Dr. Lee. Um, yeah, no, anyway, uh, uh, this was a great talk uh, by the other presenters. Uh, I think, um, you know, my work is more, unfortunately, on the advanced stage end. Like, you know, it, it, it's kind of like the cancer has gotten actually way ahead of us. I actually think the opportunity is really, uh, you know, as Dr. Akbari focused on, is really on precision, precision preventions, like uh, targeted preventions. And you really want to prevent cancer, mitigate, actually address the risk factors and, 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 and prevent cancer in a more targeted manner. Like we also have interest in obesity and endometrial cancer. You know, how do you prevent the development of cancer in that setting? There are some very obvious way to address that for gestational IUDs, but you know, we need to move that dial forward. How do we prevent cancer? And I think that's really the key. Um, you know, I actually have a question for Dr. Barry because I, I I was the head of pathology at BC Cancer. You know, and my my vision was actually to have all patients that present with cancer undergo genomics like germline genomic screens. Like, if you're gonna actually pick a and and these are not necessarily high risk from a family history standpoint, but if you're gonna pick a population that may be motivated to have 
a germline genetic screen done. And, and these things are not expensive, as you know. The challenge is really more the, the HR side of the challenge, you know, moving the workload model and all exactly. that. Exactly. That's, that's what I find to be the greatest challenge. But but it's like, that would be a, a almost a no-brainer in that sense, right? Absolutely. Absolutely, definitely. I, I uh, completely 100% agree with you that we might fall, we might not radiate for population genetic testing, but uh, we, we can, you know, get there step by step. And as you suggested, one of the steps that I think we uh, will position uh, to take is offering this to every single per, uh, you know, patient with certain cancers. Do you, uh, Dr. Akbari, want to weigh in on the question of where to put energy writ large or where we have evidence to move forward? Yes, definitely. I just I just want to, you know, uh, uh, speak about my uh, experience, you know, journey as a scientist. So I started my work back in 2000, you know, uh, 12 as a, you know, fresh scientist. And at the time, I was very excited, you know, for leading edge, you know, discoveries, finding, uh, you know, new genes and stuff like that. But uh, I I'm not saying anything wrong with that. All of us, you know, have to do leading edge, uh, you know, research, uh, including our team, you know, as uh, we just recently uh, reported uh, a new, you know, genes. But I strongly feel that we are not fully leveraging the current knowledge in genetics uh, for, uh, you know, cancer management. And this uh, identifying all people who carry a mutation in one of the high penetrant cancer susceptibility genes in an in a example of it, okay? So you, you saw the results. So 88 carriers, 58 of them will be missed <laughs> you know, to be identified till they diagnose with some sort of cancer. And even at the point that they diagnose of cancer, because many of them might not have a large families that's showing, you know, a strong family history, it still might not qualify for genetic testing. And I just want to add something here. Think of it. 25 years ago, when genetic counseling used as a screening tool for identifying people who have a higher chance of carrying a mutation and offer genetic testing to them. The cost of genetic testing was over $3,000 and cost of genetic counselor was roughly under $100. Uh, you know, dollar. Today in 2023, the cost of genetic, uh, you know, testing is around $200, $300. While the cost of genetic counseling for, you know, our hospitals, if you include everything, I'm sure it will be, you know, more than the cost of genetic testing. So it doesn't make sense anymore. We use something as a screening uh, to select for testing while it costs more. Mm -hmm. you know, financially and also logistically cost more because people have to wait sometimes for several months in order to get the testing. And many of them might be, you know, diagnosed cancer while they are waiting for their, uh, you know, precision counseling. Um, Dr. Akbari, there's a question in the chat that I'm going to ask you, and then I'm going to give the last word about where we should focus energies where there's evidence and also a question in the chat to Dr. Dennis. So the question is really, what are the next steps, Dr. Akbari, to convince the Ministry of Health in Ontario or uh, in other provinces to move forward with population-based screening? Yeah, you know, I think we, we, it's, it, it's about the time uh, and many, uh, you know, provinces I know that started, as Dr. Lee mentioned, offering genetic testing, not for the population, but for all patients with, you know, cancer. I know that there is a specific initiative here in Ontario that uh, trying to offer genetic testing to all breast cancer patients, no matter, you know, uh, what's their age or what's their, uh, you know, family history. Um, I think it's just, we need to give it time and collect information. And I have no doubt that over time, 
we will have population-based genetic testing. You know, our team, the, I, I see Dr. Stephen Nared here among the uh, audience. Dr. Stephen Nared was among, you know, the pioneers who are advocating for this back in 2006, 2007. In those years, we do not have the tools for, you know, uh, offering them. At those years, still the cost of genetic testing was very expensive. But now we are at the point that we have all the requirements and I think it's just a matter of the time and we will get there. Thank you. Um, so Dr. Dennis, I'd like to ask you, uh, this is from the chat, looking at the timeline for women's depressive occurrences across the lifetime, is there a correlation with estrogen levels and the occurrence of depressive episodes? Yeah, I, I think that's a great question. I know that sex differences in depressive symptoms really emerge post puberty um, in, in that developmental space. I'm much newer to changes in depressive symptoms in older adults. And so how that tracks with um, changes in, in sex hormone levels as adults age, um, that's a space that we're, we're newly getting into, but I think that's a great question and some something that uh, I know there's some literature out there, so I'll have to look into that. Um, and then I think, Tamila, you asked me to, to comment a little bit more broadly on, on precision health. And um, it, my thoughts on it are we, we know that, that sex differences exist in mental health conditions. And we know that genetics are important. Um, they, their, their level of importance varies depending on the condition, but something like depression, um, we know that genetics affects between 30 to 50% of, of inter-individual differences in risk. So we know genetics are important and we know there are sex differences, but unfortunately, even with biobanks at their current scale, we just don't have the sample sizes to be able to tease apart how genetics may be influencing those sex differences. So um, at least for, for precision health and sex differences in precision health in the mental health space, uh, I think we're still a ways away. Thank you. Um, uh, others are bringing forward other advocacy pieces around bridging the gaps. We need some health economists. We need Canadian cost effectiveness data. We need to work with the insurers and with employers um, really to increase access. But the three of you have given us some insight. And I think for me, excitement and hope about how um, precision medicine and this genetics research can actually move the dial and is moving the dial on women's health. So thank you very much. And I hope that those who attended will follow us and consider coming back to the Women's Health Research Seminar it, that we'll hold in January as well. Thanks very much again to you three as the presenters. Thank you very much. Thank you so much.